sure we're cooking here. All right, so we were supposed to write binary to uh, integer um, uh, for this class, so it's going to be pretty similar to what we had before. So if we just take this exact code, um, you know, actually it's close to this. Uh, well, actually, this will work. This will work for the exact code. So if we take this, we kind of did this a little bit backwards than we than I historically do it. Um, because usually we would do binary to integer first. In fact, actually, let's write it the way that I am um, was originally considering. So we'll take this out here. And um, yeah, this will be this will be fine. So we're going to write our standard loop that goes through our string from end to uh, beginning. So for int i is equal to zero, i is greater than or equal to bin dot length, i minus minus. All right, um, and then we'll go ahead and just store inside of cur char uh, bin dot char at i. So we'll get our current character. So historically. Um, we would ask a question. So I usually would teach binary to integer first. So we would ask the question, well, am I looking at a zero or am I looking at a one? Rather than call our uh, char to int function that we have now. So we would say if um, per char is equal to a one, then we'll say total plus equals placed well, just total plus equals place. If it's a zero, we won't do anything with it because zero times place would be zero. So we'd be adding a zero onto, uh, uh, and then in the end, we'll return total. So that would be kind of the simplified version with binary. We only actually have to add anything if we're looking at a one. Does that make sense? So if we have one, zero, one, though we have a one in the ones place, So if I, I'm walking it from the um, end towards the beginning. So this is 1 times 1 plus 0 times 2 plus 1 times 4. 0 times anything is always going to be a 0. So we really can just ignore that, correct? So we are only interested in when we're actually looking at a 1. If it's a one, do something. Otherwise, if it's a zero, we're not doing anything. Make sense? All right, so that's why we would have the code looking like this. We're going to go through our binary string. We're only interested if we see a one. If we have a one, just go ahead and add place to it. Each time through, we'll say place times equals two to uh, increase uh, times equals two to multiply it by two so on and so forth. Does that make sense? So we should be able to uh, run this on our uh, input here. Let's just get rid of these two. And our sample input for homework assignment was, oh, one zero one one, and this should give us our eleven. Oh, hello. Integer takes in bin, place is one, total is zero. We go ahead and set cur char equal to bin dot char at i. If we're equal to a one. And we'll say total plus equals place. Or zero. Let's 
for char would equal one. First time through, the second time through. Oh, thank you. Greater equal to zero. Starting off at bin dot length minus one and keep them going go all the way to and including zero. So there's our eleven. Alright, so that's binary to integer. Now what if we wanted to do octal to integer? Take in an octal number, convert that to uh, uh, integer. So it's a base 8 number instead of it being, um, so here we're going to steal this top, well, I'll just write it again. Static int octal to integer is going to take in a string oct as a parameter. Place will start off as 1. We're going to multiply it by 8 each time through. We'll have our running total. Starting off at zero, uh, we'll do our char per char like we did down there. And then we'll do our i is equal to oct dot length minus one. i is greater than or equal to zero. i minus minus. All right, we'll go ahead and grab our cur char is equal to oct dot char at i. Now, for octal, the possible characters that our char could be is 0 through 7. Makes sense? So octal is base 8, base 8, so we have 0 through 7. Uh, decimal is base 10, 0 to 9. Binary is base 2, 0 to 1. All right, so this guy can have all the characters 0 to 7 within it. Well, we can do what we, would, what we did here in the binary to integer where we could ask a question. We can say if it's a 1, do this. If it's a 2, do this. If it's a 3, do this. So on and so forth, right? All right, so if we look at our solution before from string to int, where we actually got our um, integer version of our character and then multiply it by place, this should work. So we're not going to look for negative numbers right now, although we, we, we certainly could. Um, but we're going to go ahead and just take those two lines here. We'll add to our total the conversion of Kerchar um, into an integer. So whether it's a 1 all the way up to a uh, 7 won't matter. We're going to get the numeric version of that, multiply it by place, and then each time through, place goes up by 8. Or multiplies by 8. And then in the end, we'll go ahead and return our total. Right, so that's octal to integer. So we're starting to see a pretty definitive pattern here as we go through, right? Okay. Now, where things start getting a little tricky is let's say that I want to convert hexadecimal to um, uh, an integer. So hexadecimal is base 16. So what are the legal digits in base 16? Base 8 was 0 to 7, base 2 was 0 to 1, base 10 was 0 to 9. What are the legal digits in base 16? Go ahead. Uh, F. Yeah, so 0 to 9, then A to F. All right, so we have effectively 0 to 15, but the problem is, is that we need to have individual digits for doing the numbers. And the number 11 isn't an individual digit, it's two digits <laughs> in order to accomplish that. So we replace a 10 with an A, an 11 with a B, a 12 with a C, so on and so forth, up to a 15 with an F. So if we're going to write static int hex to integer, and we're going to take in a hex value here, and let me just steal this code as a starting point. And we'll multiply by 16 each time. Right now, this guy is going to get us a, um, I guess, a, a poor result. All right, that is to say, 
we look at our char to int function, let me write it down here. This guy has at bucket zero is a zero, at bucket one is a one, at bucket two is a two, bucket three is a three, so on and so forth. So this only supports zero to nine. What else do we need to put in here to make this work for hex? We just said that for hexadecimal, a 10 is actually an A. 11 is actually a B, so on and so forth. This says... A 9 is at position 9. An A is at position 10. A B is at position 11. Make sense? So now we can use our same trick as we had before, and if we pass this guy the character A from a hexadecimal number, it'll spit back out the number 10, Okay, which as we decided last time is mathable. I invented that last time, right? Yeah, okay. I checked it. It wasn't a pre, so it's we invented that. I put you as co-authors. Um, all right, so uh, 0 to f. So now this function here works fine going in that direction. Okay. So now we can take in our favorite uh, hexadecimal uh, number. Uh, let's see here. All right, taking our favorite hexadecimal number, it's going to go through and it should convert that number to base 10. Okay, anybody have a favorite hexadecimal number? Because I do. So hex to integer. My favorite hexadecimal number is BAD. All right, so we convert that into its uh, decimal equivalent. 2989. So we have a single function that works for, uh, well, that now works for hexadecimal. Now, as we've already seen, all of these functions pretty much look identical, right? So rather than writing five different functions or four different functions for doing pretty much the same thing, couldn't we write a static int base to integer, have this guy take in a, um, a string s, and an int, it's called a radix, that's uh, the, the base of a number, mathematical lingo. Then we could steal this code right here and change the hexes to s. And then instead of multiplying by 16, we would multiply it by radix to give us the next value. All right, so now this is base to integer. So I can go through here. Well, we'll leave them for now. Those guys have all been replaced by this one dude now. All right, where we just made our algorithm a little bit more generic by doing it based on whatever Radix was passed in. So now we can say system.out.println driver.base to integer, we'll pass it the BAD with a radix of 16. So we'll tell it what base that guy's in, and we should get the same value. Does that make sense? Now, as we currently have it written, what base do we go up to? What's the largest base that our base to integer will function for? How can we make it work for larger bases? I mean, does, does base 28 exist? So, I mean, it's not a commonly used base. The reason we've specifically mentioned decimal, binary, octal, and hex is those are our, well, decimals are human base, right? Ten fingers, ten toes, makes sense. Binary is for computers, octals is for computers, and hexadecimal is also uh, for computers. And I'm going to actually show you a little trick here in a second that... Um, uh, helps us kind of understand that, put it into some um, context. But actually, let's talk about that right now. Uh, well, let's answer the first question first. How do we expand our base to integer to work for larger bases? Go ahead. Yeah, finish the alphabet. So inside of this guy...
put the rest of the alphabet um, in the char to int. And now this guy supports up to base 36. Actually, 37. Base 37. After that, we need to start inventing new symbols. Right, because now we're out of letters of the alphabet. But we already have a uh, um, kind of an algorithm for how bases would work. So nothing says that we absolutely have to use the letters of the alphabet. That's just what we've decided to use. We just need single characters. So we can go kind of, uh, um, you know, assuming we have the keyboard to support it, we can go uh, Big Mang Theory version of this and you know do it based on the Klingon alphabet or something. I can only assume their alphabet has more letters than 26. I don't know that for any sort of real reason, but I suspect that's the case. <laughs> does, does anybody actually know? Somebody has written the Klingon. <laughs> there is the Klingon documented language somewhere. <laughs> See, somebody's Googling it. <laughs> How many characters in the Klingon alphabet? All right, we're going to do it. <laughs> Klingon alphabet. How many letters in the Klingon alphabet? I even had a completion for. Oh, here's the Klingon. Oh, Klingon alphabets. Yeah, we're going to need the keyboard for that one. <laughs> what is. The... So somebody has invented like an official. Hmm. Even has an ISO standard. <laughs> wow. Oh, wait a minute. That's not that verbose. <laughs> it is, I mean, it's like really well thought out. <laughs> so this is the TLH sound, I guess. This is this is the script version. So this is Klingon cursive. All right, yeah. So Klingon's not going to help us. <laughs> so we've, now that we've settled that, um, all right. So in any case, we support up to base thirty-seven here. So now let's look at a couple of uh, interesting tricks. And this is uh, away from the programming side, but more back to number conversion stuff. So at this point, we know how to convert from any base into decimal, right? Now, have we done uh, conversions from a base back to decimal? I'm sorry, uh, from decimal into any base. So if I gave you, um, for instance, the number 11 and asked you to convert that back into binary, do we know how to do that? Have we ever talked about that or have you had that in any of your classes? No, I haven't talked about it. Okay. So to convert a decimal number, so this is 11 in decimal to base 2, to binary, we're going to divide 11 over and over and over again by 2, record the remainder, then read the answer from bottom up. So 11 divided by 2, how many times does 2 go into 11? It goes 5 times, 5 times 2 is 10, with a remainder of 1. How many times does 2 go into 5? 2 goes into 5 2 times. 2 times 2 is 4 with a remainder of 1. How many times does 2 go into 2? 1 time. 1 times 2 is 2 with a remainder of 0. How many times does 2 go into 1? 0 times. 0 times 2 is 0 with a remainder of 1. Okay, we know we're done when we finally have a 0 here. We read our answer from the bottom up. So this answer is 1011. Make sense? All right, so same exact thing if we wanted to convert um, a base 8 number uh, into, well, a decimal number into base 8 we would divide by 8 here instead of divide by 2. Um, let's look at our 2989, since that's my favorite number. So if we want to take 2989 and take that to hex, 
we would do 2989 divided by 16. And let's see, 2989 divided by 16 goes in 186 times. That's 186. Um, 186 times 16 is 2976 uh, minus 2989. So that's a remainder 13. We actually should have known that to work backwards because we know what the answer should be. It should be BAD. 186 divided by 16. is 11, 11 times 16 is going to be 176, or one, yeah, 176. Which is a remainder of 10. 11 divided by 16 is zero, zero times 16 is zero with a remainder of 11. All right, so then we read our answer from bottom up. So that's 11, 10, 13, but we need to now convert those into their hexadecimal digits. So an 11 is a B, a 10 is an A, a 13 is a D. Make sense? So exact same pattern goes there. Uh, so now some interesting things, uh, kind of... Um, you know, we've mentioned and we probably at least have all heard that uh, binary, octal, hexadecimal are all kind of popular computer numbers, right? Uh, human beings, we, we, we like the decimal thing, base 10, because uh, of the 10 fingers, 10 toes. Uh, why is binary uh, popular for computers? What's, what's the, the perk of binary? Why we've chosen that base system for uh, something that computers like? All right, tell me more about that. What, what makes it simplistic? Would you rather count in binary or hex, or a binary or a decimal? So you'd prefer to switch over your entire, because uh, we have trouble counting, right? Because, I mean, how many of you still do the counting? And then the, the follow-up is, do you start with the thumb, or do you start with the, I think, uh, typical Americans start with the thumb. Like one, two, three, four, five, but a lot of, pretty much the rest of the world, I think, starts with uh, the, you know why you learn that? It's from a movie, Inglorious Past. <laughs> and then I went and looked it up. <laughs> it is actually a fact. Um, okay, so in any case, um, so uh, so we, we like base 10. Why do computers like base 2? Go ahead. Yeah, it's digital. I mean, digital logic says on or off, zero or one, true or false. I mean, it's, it's, we need two digits to represent digital logic. Okay, so it makes complete sense for us. All right. So having said that, uh, that's why binary is popular for that. What about octal? Yeah, let's, let's go to the other extreme. Let's talk about hexadecimal. What's the advantage of hexadecimal? Why would we choose that as a numbering system that could be could be beneficial to us? It's a smaller way it has a smaller number of ways to store bigger numbers. Big numbers look smaller. Smaller footprint, right? So we can store big numbers in a smaller footprint. We already saw that 2989 compressed, a four-digit number compressed into a three-digit number. BAD, right? So where we use uh, hexadecimal pretty often is in memory addresses. All right, so for example, if we come out here, I think at some point we have, uh, um, do we look at pointers or anything in C? All right, so I'll just create a new tab here real quick. I'll just show you quickly so we can actually see it. I think I have a C program somewhere in here. Um, Hello.C probably. Maybe blah.C. Let's for structs. 
Well, let's try hello.c, otherwise we'll just write it ourselves. Ah, this would be good enough. So we'll just create an integer called a, set it equal to 15. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and print out the address of a. So this will print out the memory location where a lives. All right, hexadecimal number. So if we were to convert that hexadecimal number into a uh, decimal, would that be, that would be a pretty big number, right? Okay, just imagine <laughs> that we can, when we compress the number down to hexadecimal, it, it, uh, uh, we, we really gain quite a bit. So that number is going to explode out to something pretty ridiculous. Um, all right, so having said that, what if we have, uh, um, what if I wanted to convert that to binary? How big of a binary number would that be? So now that we know how to go both directions for conversion, we decided we wanted to convert that number into binary. Would that be a lot of fun? So what would we do right now initially? Our starting point would probably be let's convert that into uh, decimal, right? And then go decimal to binary. Since now we know how to take a base to decimal, we know how to take another, um, uh, then we know how to take decimal to a base we would probably use decimal as our middleman. So this is the ones place, the 16s place, 256, 4096. <laughs> okay, it's gonna get pretty pretty ridiculous pretty quickly. All right, so now well, one thing we can do is we can go through here and we can, uh, let's add some spaces. So this is a nice shortcut and another reason why we uh, represent so many different bases in, uh, well, those three bases in, in technology. So we can replace all the Fs here with 15s, right? Uh, C is going to be 13, no, 12. This is gonna be 14. 12, oh, that was a B, 11, 10, and then uh, C is 12, like that. All right, so when you look at the numbers that way, are there any conclusions you can make uh, about any of those individual sets of numbers? How many bits would it take to represent a 15? Bits is in binary digits, zeros and ones. Four. So the largest hexadecimal value is a 15. We can represent that with four bits. So what we can actually do is we can replace that guy with his binary equivalent, this guy with his binary equivalent, this guy with his binary equivalent, all in four bit chunks, and that's the conversion. Okay. We don't actually have to go from uh, hex to decimal, then back to, to binary. We can do a direct conversion. Make some sense? All right, so um, I suppose we can just do this real quick since we don't have too many different things. So um, a seven is four bits, so this is this is the ones place, the twos place, the fours place. So this is one, one, one. That's a seven. A 15 would be what? All right, so this is the 
ones, twos, fours, eights. So this is eight plus four plus two plus one. All right, so okay. What about a uh, five? This is the ones, twos, fours. So that's a five. Got a four. And then we need a 12. Then we need a three. Then we need a 14. So that's an eight plus a four. Is that a 14? Uh, no, actually, that one, right? Uh, then we need an 11, so that's going to be an 8 plus a 4. What am I at here? That's what I was doing on my laptop before. So 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. That's an 11. Then 1, that's 8. 8, 9, 10, so 0. And then our 12 is going to be 1100. Zero, zero. 8 plus 4. Where am I at for 11? This guy? So this is 8. Oh, yeah, we can't do that. That should be a 0. So this is 8, 9, 10, 11. All right. And then take all the spaces out. That's your binary equivalent. All right, so now let's kick it down the slide here. Let's say we wanted to have a um, the octal number 137. So we'll put a little O after that. That's octal. To, um, uh, let's see, to binary. So we'll ask the same question. How many bits would it take to represent a 7? Three. So you can break this guy up into three individual things. And then our conversion would be um, that. Do it in three bit chunks to go from octal to binary. Okay. So that's one of the nice friendly ways of going between your. Uh, um, uh, your different settings. So why is uh, octal helpful in uh, computers? So we've dealt with the two extremes. We said that binary, perfect representation of, uh, you know, binary logic on, off, zero, one, so digital logic. Um, hexadecimal allows us to store larger numbers and smaller footprints. What about octal? How many unique digits are there in octal? Eight, right? Zero to seven. Does eight mean anything to us in computers? How many bits are in a byte? Eight bits equals one byte. All right, so, uh, and we've all heard of bytes before. So bytes are a pretty common way for us to represent things, especially data sizes and also, uh, uh, connection speeds, transfer rates, that kind of stuff. So um, having that middleman, the multiple of the zeros and ones, the multiple of the binaries to take us to uh, uh, bytes uh, is helpful. So that's where the octal stuff comes in. Make some sense? All right. So having said that, let's look at an algorithm here. If I wrote a function that took in a decimal number, decimal to base, all right? So this could take in a number like 11 and a two, and it should convert the decimal number of 11 into the binary number, the base two number uh, equivalent. So we wanna write the algorithm for doing this. Well, we had it here on the previous screen. Let's go back here to this guy. So here's an 11 to base 2. So we took our starting number, 
and we kept whittling it down until it finally got to a zero. And each time through, we divided it by the base we're converting it to, and we recorded the number. Make sense? All right, so as long as our current value, the current number we're whittling down, is not a zero, we're going to do something. What kind of structure would we use in our, from our programming tool set to do something some number of times until some condition is true? Some kind of loop. Some kind of loop. In this particular case, um, we don't necessarily know how many times we're going to have to whittle it down. So do we have a specific loop that lends itself to problems where we do not know how many times we need to repeat? While loop. All right. So while our initial value is greater than zero, do some stuff. All right. So while our, so let's look at our parameters. So params are going to be um, decimal number and radix, the number we're converting to. So while decimal number is greater than zero, do some stuff. All right, what stuff are we going to do? Well, we need to divide it by the radix. And there's two outputs that we're interested in there. Okay, one output is the remainder of that division. The other output is the result, quotient, of that division. All right. How do we get the remainder of an integer division? What tool in our toolbox allows us to get the remainder of an integer division? Did this analysis even and odd stuff? So we asked, is a certain number evenly divisible by two? If it was, it was an even number. If it wasn't, it was an odd number. What did we use to get the remainder? In Alice, it was called remainder, but we connected it to uh, a mathy term called modulo or modulus. All right, so we're going to take. Um, Decimal number mod, well, so modulo, radix. Now, let's ask this question. Go back to this example here. I need to record my remainder first before I can overwrite my decimal number with the, the new value. Otherwise, I've, I've broken my number. If I say, okay, well, 11, I'm going to say, if I say decimal number, which in this case is 11, divided by 2 is equal to 5, at that point, I've changed decimal number to be equal to 5. If I then try to go and retrieve the remainder of 1, in this particular case, I luck out and I get a 1, but it's the wrong one. Make sense? So I need to make sure I record my answer first. And then I can whittle down my number. So I want to get the remainder of decimal number modulo radix and record that somewhere. So we're going to say record decimal number modulo radix. So when I say record something, that means we're remembering something. And what do we usually do when we are trying to remember something? What tool from our toolbox allows us to remember something for later use? Variable. All right, so that guy's going to be a variable. So we'll record that decimal number, modulo radix. Then we're going to modify decimal number to itself divided by radix. Okay, that'll whittle it down. When we spin back up, we then ask the question, is decimal number still greater than zero? Yeah, it, will, it might be. If it is, we're going to do the same crap again. All right, now the idea here is when we record our answer, what are we likely doing here since we're building up a result? So look at our 
uh, number here. In the end, I said we read our answer from bottom up. So based on the tools we have in our toolbox, if we're trying to remember a collection of like values, a one, then a one, then a zero, then a one, and we need to be able to read it backwards, what kind of construct have we been using lately that could help us remember multiple digits like this? We've been doing things a lot with string concatenation, right? So couldn't we just keep tossing our answer onto a string? All right. So we say this is a variable. Maybe we say this should be in a string variable that we keep building up. Something like that. Now, whether you choose to build it in reverse or you choose to build it forwards and then call your reverse function that you've previously wrote, doesn't really matter. Okay? Probably building it the right way first saves you a couple of uh, you know, microseconds, probably less than that, on the, the, uh, during runtime, but human beings aren't going to notice. So it doesn't really matter. Just know in the end if your answer is backwards or not <laughs> so it gets uh, printed the right way. All right, so in the end, we will return the string variable with our result if we built it in reverse or return the reverse of that value if we built uh, let's just say with normal concatenation okay so one challenge you'll have for your homework assignment is how could you uh, concatenate build up a string in reverse through, through concatenation Pretty simple to do, but you'll have to consider it. I'll give you a hint. It involves the empty string. All right. So, so now, next uh, final caveat here. For all of our bases, uh, so this is decimal to base, so it should work on all the bases that our alphabet supports. All right. So this is up to base 37. Well, base 0 through 9, or base 0 to, or 1 to 10, rather, um, this algorithm, as we have it written right now, will work. But if we think about our common base larger than 10 would be base 16. Well, with base 16, as we saw here, our results are 13, 10, 11. So we would be concatenating a 13 onto a string, or a 10 onto a string, or an 11 onto a string. So before we just haphazardly uh, concatenate something, shouldn't we convert this number into its single digit equivalent? So a 13 would become a D. Does that make sense? So perhaps we have a function called int to char takes a, well, it's called val, takes an int val as a parameter. This guy returns the char, and we're going to write this, so it's going to be static, equivalent of the integer parameter. Okay. That is to say, a 4 becomes a 4. A 7 becomes a 7. A 13 becomes a D. Something like that. So we need to call it to char before we concatenate. So record the decimal number modulo radix. Let's do this. 
convert decimal number modular radix into a char using your int to char function. Record the result. Make sense? So you need to make sure you have a, a secondary function that you're going to write. Pretty simple one. Um, so you're going to write int to char, and you're also going to write decimal to base. So if we're going to write this static string decimal to base, we'll take in an int uh, decimal number and an int radix. That would be the parameters for that guy. All right, so two separate functions for your homework. A hint on this guy. It involves the trick index of and char at. Remember, those guys are inverses of each other. All right, so we're already using index of in our uh, what int to char, or no char to int. Now we're doing int to char. Char at might be your friend in this guy. Make sense? All right, I will see everybody on. Monday.